Well, hello and welcome to A Thousand Conversations About the Future. Um, this is a project of the Ithaca Green New Deal that aims to engage you in a conversation about the future of Ithaca. And I am your lovely and charming host, Rebecca Evans, Sustainability Specialist with the City of Ithaca. This particular conversation that we're having today is part of a series that we actually need your help with choosing the title of. So stay tuned in just a second. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat to a doodle poll so that you can help us decide what to actually call this thing. But this series is gonna feature experts that are chatting about kind of the geekier side of the Green New Deal. So we're talking tech, economics, electrification, and jobs, kind of the stuff that really makes the IGND tick. And I can assure you that there will definitely be geeks present. Um, some panelists are gonna be local, some will not, but all are gonna be experts in their field and they're ready to start a conversation with you and with us. So make sure to tune in every other Wednesday, unlike today on our YouTube channel, we will be live streaming these in the future, um, but we'll leave the chat open both here and on YouTube. So if you do have questions, comments, or ideas, please do interact with us. We wanna hear from you. Um, and we'll do our best to make sure that everyone's everyone's questions are answered. Um, but first, we need a name for this thing. So I'm going to put a link in the chat for everybody if you don't mind visiting that and voting on a title. So you can leave that up in the background if you like. But um, after the event, we will share the title that we decide on via our newsletter. So if you are not already subscribed to our newsletter, go to a thousandconversations.org and do subscribe. But um, without further ado, I guess let's kick this thing into gear. Um, our first conversation is about none other than the Ithaca Green New Deal. And oh boy, do we have some geeks here to talk about it. Our first guests are Terry Carroll, Chief Sustainability Officer with the Tompkins County and Luis Aguirre Torres. Director of Sustainability for the City of Ithaca. And I'm reading here, um, Luis is also a very good boss. So Terry and Luis, please take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Rebecca. And, and, and thank you, Terry and everybody else for being here. I, I really hope that you guys, you know, suggest some good names because we have gone over, you know, lunch talks, tech talks, uh, I believe TED talks was taken. So, you know, if you can think of anything that, that you know, we could call this series of uh, meetings, it would be fantastic. Uh, and thank you so much, Terry, for uh, agreeing to talk to me just for everybody else before I, I stop talking and, and let Terry say something. Uh, Terry and I, you know, agreed to talk about, you know, sustainability today, but we didn't agree on what we were going to talk about. We just decided there was going to be a candid conversation and, and we're going to try to, you know, talk, uh, you know, between the two of us, but also addressing everybody in the community. So thank you very much for being here. And, and Terry, you know, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I mean, this is something that, you know, you and I chat probably a couple times a week, but it's, you know, often just the two of us. So I think it's a, an interesting perspective for others to get to see what we talk about. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, man. I, I think, you know, the whole idea was to talk a little bit about the Ithaca Green New Deal. But uh, what I suggest we do is we talk about what the Ithaca Green New Deal actually means. You know, uh, and because we can talk about it and, and Rebecca was, you know, making reference to us being geeks, you know, and, and us talking in terms of carbon emissions or, or but what is it like, uh, before I, I say what it means to me, like, I, I want to ask you, I want to put you on the spot and, and see, like, what do you think the Ithaca Green New Deal is about? You know, what, what do you think we're trying to do here? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, for me, you know, I, I love history. It's something that I, you know, I, I read about it. I listen to podcasts about it. And, you know, the, the Ithaca Green New Deal, I always kind of gravitate you know, surprisingly to that, the last two words, the, the New Deal part, and thinking about, you know, Roosevelt's New Deal and, and everything that that encompassed. And so when I think about, you know, the Green New Deal, it's very much about job creation. It's about trying to touch, you know, pretty much every walk of life. I mean, that original New Deal was, you know, to take us out of the Great Depression, you know, and we're, I guess, I, I would say we're not in a Great Depression, although maybe some would, would quibble with that. But I think, you know, we are at a place where, you know, for a lot of people, things aren't going as well as it should be, or as well as it could be. And I think that this is a really an opportunity to delve into that and not make it just about renewable energy or energy efficiency, but really making it about, you know, this whole green revolution, you know, Naomi Klein's book about, you know, the changes that could be brought about by environmentalism. And I think that to me is what it is, you know, can we create 
good, well-paying jobs? Can we bring equity to the community? Can we, you know, reflect and, and try and restructure our, our social systems? Can we, you know, try and address the, you know, the racism and, and all the, the marginalization that happens? You know, and, and can we do it, I guess, in this green context? You know, climate change is a paramount issue. It's something that we need to address. But, you know, let's use that as a, a vehicle to try and address all these other issues as well. And, and I, I, you know, I, I agree with you. I, I, I love to read about all of these things. And I think the history of the Green New Deal, you know, from the very original uh, New Deal and, and to what we have today and the different efforts to have a Green New Deal, you know, uh, accepted in, in Washington, every state. And, you know, I'm very glad that our community decided to take on it. But, uh, you know, recently I was reading this article in The Atlantic and, and they are basically talking about uh, the Green New Deal and the different attempts of the Green New Deal. And every time they say that, you know, the problem with the Green New Deal is the ambition. The level of ambition is just, just impossible. Uh, and people get disappointed. And a lot of the time, you know, like all these goals are, are never met. And then you have a bunch of cynics talking about, you know, like, why would you even try something that is actually impossible? And, and you know, on, on one hand, when they make the arguments in this article, uh, and, and they talk about, you know, both conservatives, progressives, they talk about, you know, how everybody had a hand into making the Green New Deal not a success. And, you know, it, it's debatable. I, I don't really agree with everything that they say in there. But, you know, what stuck with me was, was this idea that uh, if it is overly ambitious, it has a very high risk of, of never happening and therefore disappointing people and never having people on board. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, really, I really don't think I, I think the opposite, you know, I really think that, you know, you need to shoot for the stars uh, and, and in the process, you're going to learn lessons and you're going to probably get not where you, where you thought you were going to be, but where you actually have to be. So I, I don't know, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's, it's tricky, right? You know, everyone's different. You know, some people see an insurmountable goal and they, you know, that galvanizes them. They're like, I want to go for it. You know, I really want to try and, you know, push as hard as I can to get there, whereas others you know, see that ambitious goal and they think, you know, we're never going to get there anyways. And they kind of become despondent. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, what we see reflected in kind of this article that you're talking about and kind of some of the perspectives. You know, I think you and I probably lean more towards, you know, that former of, you know, this seems impossible, but hey, let's, let's go for it. Let's see how far we can, you know, get with it. And I think, you know, it is one of those things where climate change is, you know, it's, it's huge. It's, it's one of these things that, you know, the brain can't really digest. It's one of these impossible issues to really kind of conceptualize, you know, how are we really going to solve this? And I think we all have moments where it's like, you know, this just isn't going to happen. What am I doing? I should go build a cabin in the woods and never talk to anyone ever again. And then you kind of, you know, brush yourself off a little bit and you think, okay, now we really got to do something about this. And so I think, you know, having these ambitious goals, especially, you know, for you and I working for municipalities, you know, trying to be leaders, I think, you know, one of the roles of municipal governments is to, to be that leader, to show what is possible. And I think by setting these ambitious goals, you know, as municipalities, we're not only trying to, to show what's possible for other municipalities, but to try and show to our residents, you know, what's possible as well. You know, if we, you know, a local government with hundreds of cars, you know, dozens of buildings, can get to net zero, you know, maybe you as a resident with, you know, a car or two or, you know, a house or an apartment, maybe you can get there as well. And so I think, you know, that's, that's part of it is can we, can we show by showing some ambition, can we provide some of that leadership and, and really try and, and galvanize our populations to, to fight along with us? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, the, <laughs> it is funny because we do this for a living. Uh, but we also do this because we like living. You know, it's, it's it's that kind of thing that you know we, we just love uh, you know our job and and we geek it out very often. We talk about all the possibilities and we go beyond these 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 dreams. No, and it is very interesting to think that you know we come from such different backgrounds, but we actually meet right here and we're talking about the same thing. And and the objective is not you know elevate anybody, but elevate the actual principle behind what we're trying to do. And I, honestly, I I really think that I am very you know, like I tend to be very romantic about this, 
because I really think we are doing this because somebody has to, and if it's not us, who has to, who, who will do it? And and you know, I'm talking about us, the community. Uh, but I also believe that you know there are some very important principles associated with what we're trying to do here. And and you alluded to that at the very beginning. You know, it, it, this is about the people. This is about you know doing right by a lot of people. And for me, you know, I'm I'm, I'm new to this community, uh, even though you know my 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 wife moved here like long time ago. I've been here for really a short time. And in this time, it has been, you know, a crash course on on on, on local politics, uh, on, on community relations. Uh, it has been, you know, different, a very different understanding of what with what it means to, you know, environmental justice here. And and and, and I want to I want to learn from you. Like you, you grew up here, you know, you're part of this community. You you were, you know, part of this. Like, well, Syracuse, you know, we're, we're very close, man. So, uh, so, so what is your take on that? And uh, and you know, what we're trying to do, whether the community agrees with us, whether we are actually, there is a, a real principle behind that actually rests on, on something that makes this community unique. Like, what, what is your take on that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I grew up outside of Syracuse in a, a small rural town, Marcellus, you know, so not too far away here, but I think, you know, there's the, the saying that if it goes 10 square miles, you know, surrounded by reality. So, you know, I've been here for for seven, eight years now, I think I'm starting to get to know the community a little bit. Um, and I think it is different. I think it, it is unique in, in a lot of ways. You know, when we talk about, you know, loving our jobs, I think we also got to be very clear that what we're working to do is to put ourselves out of a job. You know, I think we would both, you know, like to be able to, to have, you know, the city and county respectively turn to us and say, hey, you know, you saw the climate change, you're no longer necessary anymore. And I think, you know, in our, in our battle to get towards that goal, you know, I think if we were in a lot of other places, I think the, the path would be a little bit different. And I think this is kind of getting to what you're talking about, you know, this romanticized notion of, of the Green New Deal and, and what it can attain. Because I think for a lot of places, you know, combating climate change is, okay, it's a number. You know, we got to get our emissions to zero. And however we're going to do it, you know, Let's, let's get there as fast as possible. Let's just buy a bunch of renewable energy credits or certificates. Let's buy offsets. Let's just make sure that at the end of the day, we can say that our contribution to emissions is zero. And I think, you know, that's not gonna fly in this community. I think, you know, if the, the city of Ithaca tomorrow said, okay, we're gonna spend, you know, part of our, you know, budget to buy just certificates and offsets so that we can claim that we're net zero. But at the same time, we're gonna keep buying, you know, diesel trucks and we're going to keep you know putting in buildings with natural gas and we're going to keep allowing our residents to you know use as much fossil fuels as they want and we're not going to care at all about the jobs component we're not going to care at all about you know actually you know making sure that the atmosphere is improving we're just making sure that that number is zero you know i think that there would be a huge outcry I don't think anyone in the community would, would be okay with it. I think activists would come and, and probably burn our houses down, Louis. <laughs> so, you know, I think that that's maybe a little bit of a difference between this community and some other places where, you know, it's it's not enough to say that we're gonna get to net zero. It's it's all about what is that process? How do we get there? What are the, the benefits? It's about seizing that opportunity of, you know, not just saying, okay, we're gonna hit net zero, but we're gonna use this as that opportunity, this new deal opportunity to create jobs, to address racial inequities, you know, any number of, you know, different things that I think a lot of people, you know, especially um, people that aren't as familiar with kind of climate change, you know, the, the elements that they don't really think about. Look, I, I have a, th there is this, uh, this problem I have. <laughs> like, you know, from, from the moment I came here, I, you know, one of the things that I've been telling people is that, you know, I see climate change probably different from, from some, but I, I think a lot of us see it as a global problem. You know, we're part of a, of a global problem. We're doing our part. And some people say, yeah, well, even if you mitigate all the emissions uh, in the Ithaca region, in, in the entire county, you know, it, it's, it's going to be like a drop in the bucket. It's, it's really nothing. Uh, but, I, but I think that, you know, it is important that we do that. But we, it's also important that we reach outside. So then, then you start thinking about programs because our jobs uh, have to do with developing programs that will, you know, accelerate the transition. But at the same time, these have to be approved locally. And, and when they have to be approved locally, it just means, you know, we need to make sure that it benefits mostly our community. So 
you have to present a program to legislators where you're actually convincing them this is a, a big program that is going to change the world it's going to start here but you know we need these these people we need to race with the un uh, we need to work with washington with albany we need to work with other other cities and then frequently they themselves are limited yeah but i need to do what what my you know the people that elect me want and and i'm struggling with that i really am i i uh, you know, this is a really good opportunity for a candid conversation about that. Honestly, I don't know how to go about that sometimes. And I understand all the elements. It's just like, how do you define a program that will have global consequences, but at the same time, will take care of the specific needs of, of the people in the community. So legislators can allow you to implement it, you know? Yeah. Uh, you have more experience than me on that probably. So uh, why, what do you think? No, I mean, I think in some ways I have, you know, the easier job of the two of us, you know, right, right now my focus is very much just on kind of, you know, making sure that the internal Tompkins County government operations are, are getting to net zero and, and then, you know, looking towards the outside a little bit after that, whereas you're kind of the, the little bit of the opposite where you're looking at the community first and kind of the internal operations along with Rebecca, you know, alongside, but a, a little bit later. And so, you know, I think it's easier for me, but I guess, you know, a question for you is, do you, I mean, it's, I guess it comes down to this question of a top down or bottom up approach, you know, and so when you start thinking about it, are you coming at it from this, you know, we need to, to solve this global issue, or are you coming at, from, coming at it from how, how do we support, you know, our local economy, how do we, you know, develop programs that are going to have local benefits, where do you start? Well, that is a, a, a very good question, man, I, I think it has to be a little bit of both. Because I, I don't believe in, in, you know, I don't believe in a silver bullet to help our community and our economy to recover from COVID, for example. Uh, but I believe that everything that we're doing at the global scale could actually help the community, you know, get over that. And uh, for example, uh, you know, a lot of the programs that I'm thinking about and implementing, you know, they have, you know, the benefit of the community in mind, uh, but they are not achievable if we don't go beyond our community. For example, uh, I, I've been, you know, we've been talking about this potential uh, workforce development program that could that has to expand beyond our community because we probably don't have enough people to take on the jobs that we believe we can create. And, and it's not that we're going to limit ourselves to create just the jobs that this community needs because at the end of the day, you know, it's a regional problem and it extends beyond the state eventually. So, so I, I don't know how to answer the question, uh, you know, with, with a simple answer, but I believe that it really is we are part of a, a, there is a global problem that we're trying to solve with local solutions that can be scalable. But a lot of the time local has a, a, a definition that extends beyond the community. So it, it is one of those tricky things. And, and I've been struggling with that because I understand my mandate and I understand who I'm dealing with when I'm talking to the legislators. But at the same time, you know, I feel responsible uh, as, as, as a lot of people should be uh, uh, for, for climate change and, and we need to do something about it at, at the global scale, you know. I mean, the other piece of it is something that you and I have talked about as well, is that some of these solutions that, you know, we'd want to implement are just better at scale, right? You know, it, you, the prices come down, um, the benefits go up if you can do it with, you know, if you can do it for 50 houses versus five or 500 houses, 5,000 thousand houses right and when you start getting up there in scale it gets to the point where suddenly you're outside of your jurisdiction you know you don't have 50,000 houses in the city of Ithaca you know so if you want to get to that 50,000 you're starting to look around and say okay you know who else can I get to join with me and and jump on this stuff but you know at the same time that's that's not your your charge right and that's not how you know that's not how you got the position and and quite frankly some of these other places don't want to listen to you or jump in on this and so I think you know that's where it gets really difficult and it, it kind of comes along with some of this other stuff as well where you know you're trying to do some incredibly you know innovative things you know things that you know no one around here let alone, I mean in some places no one around the state or the country you know have, have really thought about you know some of the ideas that you brought up and, you know, we work for municipalities that are, you know, that are slow movers, you know, they're all traditionalists in a lot of ways, they, they don't want to be the first ones, you know, before I was in this position, I worked with municipalities across the southern tier. And, you know, the, the thing that, you know, was true, no matter the political leaning, urban, rural, suburban, whatever it was, is that they were all scared to be the first one. You know, they all wanted to know what other municipality is doing this, you know, who else has done this, who, who can we follow, what's the other example. And in your case, you know, very much your case, you know, you're trying to do things that other people haven't done before. 
And I imagine that's difficult, right? You got to imagine that that's a, that's a hard thing to, to try and pitch from your angle. Well, you, you get a lot of pushback uh, and, and you get pushback from unexpected places. Uh, I mean, it goes beyond the not in my backyard type of attitude. I mean, it really goes beyond that. And, and people get scared. And, and I do, I buy entirely into this idea that, you know, we're running out of time. I, I'm really worried, yeah. you know, and, and I think it's a consequence of working in what we do. Because we have to read stuff that is depressing you know yeah. and, and but so i have this idea that we need to go fast and we're going to learn along the way and I, I think one of the things that i bring to this job is, is this entrepreneurial attitude you know towards you know let's find the funding let's learn along the way let's let's have the product really ready to roll and then we'll fix it as, as we continue but i also understand i, I gotta be careful no i mean yeah. this is we're talking about communities economies people and it's, it's, it's not as simple i, I think I, I was reading this book. It's called The End of Energy, and uh, and, and it makes reference to to a number of things uh, about how you know the current state of uh, energy policy, uh, but it really covers environmental policy as a whole. You know, uh, it's it's far from ideal. Like it really isn't what this country needs and deserves. But it's a consequence of the lack of agreement between the two sides of the political spectrum. And then just recently, I was listening to a, a Yale professor who was talking about the, the green light versus red light approach of legislation. You know, he thinks that all the environmental legislation is about telling people what not to do. And, and we don't encourage people to innovate by telling them what to do, uh, you know, uh, beyond, you know, banning stuff. So, so he believes that we need to revamp the entire environmental framework, legislative framework, and then come up with something that will encourage innovation through legislation. And I, I think it's fascinating. And I think at the federal level, I can see that that working. But I, I've been struggling. Like, how do you bring this to the local level? How do you, you know, use the power of government to uh, really incentivize people to innovate or accept innovative solutions? Yeah, and especially you know when times are tough and, and budgets are are not in the best position. I mean, I think you know Ruth asked the question in chat: What are the biggest constraints, and how can you know people help you? I think it's one of those things where, you know, I can imagine for, you know, some of the constraints that we both face are obviously budgetary constraints. You know, if we were each awarded, you know, a billion dollars of, of funding without any strings attached, I think that could go a long way to solving a lot of these issues. But to me, I think, you know, it, it goes along with what you're saying. I think some of the, the biggest issues that we run into is there's, you know, groups of, you know, super motivated people, you know, the, you know, 30, you know, three other people on this you know, chat are, are probably fall into that group. They're super motivated. They want to work. And then you have, you know, a bunch of people that are kind of the, the diametric opposite, you know, where they don't believe in climate change. They think we're all idiots, you know, and whatever else, you know, and then there's probably the vast majority of people that fall somewhere in that middle section. And it's really trying to figure out how do you, how do you galvanize? How do you mobilize that middle area? And, you know, incentives are, are a piece of it, you know, and it's definitely one of those things where, you know, if you're offering people funding, you know, they're more likely to do something. But, you know, you get to the point where, you know, we don't have limitless reserves of money to throw at people to do things. And so what you're hoping is that you're getting to the point where if you incentivize it enough, it brings prices down and, you know, that enables everyone else to take advantage of it or, it, you know, brings a, a technology enough into the mainstream that it becomes, you know, the, you know, the new dominant solution, you know. So we're, if half the people are putting in, heat pumps, then we don't ever have to worry about people in, you know, putting in boilers or furnaces anymore, you know, and obviously those numbers are off, but, you know, but I think that one of the issues that we face, right, is that we're small local governments, you know, you, you know, trying to, to spend a bunch of money incentives and, and funding, you know, getting people to put in heat pumps isn't going to bring down the global heat pump, you know, market price. You know, it's not going to make it so that suddenly, you know, the price of, you know, the actual technology, the, the actual equipment itself is going to go down. You know, what it is going to do is hopefully create a, a workforce that knows what they're doing to put these things in. You know, it's going to try and reduce the soft costs, you know, how, you know, the soft costs of customer acquisition, the soft costs of, you know, design of permitting, you know, you're going to have these professionals that know how to do it. And so I think that there, you know, that is the big role that, that you can try and play in this is to try and, you know, really target the ways in which that's going to have a, an impact and think less about, you know, hey, by incentivizing, we're going to reduce the cost of electric vehicles or any of this other stuff. I mean, I just don't think that that's possible. 
you know, in terms of how do we get other people to help us, you know, kind of the second part of, of Ruth's question, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I'd put that to you. What do you think? How do we get people to help us with that? Wow. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we, we've been in a position, uh, we've been put in a position of leadership. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we're going to decide. It doesn't mean that we're going to do the work. It means, you know, that, that our job is to constantly think these things through. And, and analyze the options, the different alternatives. And, and then once we have an idea that could work, you know, get enough feedback so we can have this, this learning. And I think the key to this is, is, is not the personal learning, but it's, you know, the, the learning at the community level. I, I think the first thing is that everybody needs to understand this. And, and it, it's not that people need to understand the technology or the financing. I, I mean, it's about people understanding what are we up against? What are, what are our options? What is it that we can do now? What is it that we can do next year? Uh, and, and what type of you know, changes are required? And, and this you know, thinking as, as a community probably is gonna help us move the needle a little bit more. Um, I, I really think that uh, we, we suffer from, from the type of world we live in and, and the economy that we live in where it demands constant involvement in whatever it is that you do for a living. And then you never have time to study, to read, to, to have conversations. I mean, the idea of this project was precisely that, you know, let's, let's just talk and, and let's just exchange ideas and, and let's make it meaningful. Let's make it worth everybody's time. Uh, and and, and this, is, this is fantastic. I, I really, really enjoy this because it's funny because we talk a lot, but I think we, we spend half our time teasing each other. Uh, and, and then the other half dealing with realities of our job and, and we don't have time for philosophy. <laughs> so yeah. it's uh, interesting. Yeah, no, I think it is interesting. Um, you know, I think you're right. You know, it, was, <laughs> it is one of those things where, you know, we focus so much on trying to, you know, get to the, the exact point of the solutions. You know, how are we going to, you know, do X, Y, Z? And a lot of it isn't spent kind of thinking on that like you said, philosophizing as, you know, are we doing it in the right way? Are we doing it, you know, in the way that, you know, we think is probably the, the best way to do this. You know, for in general, I think that this is a, a major issue that, you know, we run into right now is that, you know, there's the, the best way to do things. And then there's the way that we generally have to try and do things because we can't get to that best way of doing things. You know, it applies to a whole, you know, suite of, of different things. You know, it's, you know, the perfect you know, way to address climate change is never going to be done just because we have to deal with the traditional systems that are already in place. And I think that that's a, a really difficult thing to, to deal with both on a, a kind of a mental and emotional, you know, level. And it, I think it helps to, to talk to other people about it. Um, you know, I, I see Peg's question of, you know, what's the first thing you would do if you had a billion dollars, you know, to, to try and combat climate change? You know, I imagine, Louise, that you would probably do something along the electrification spectrum, um, you know, and, and kind of what you're already trying to do, maybe with a little less difficulty than what you're running into, you know, and I think that that makes sense to me. You know, I think, you know, for me, I, I think about, um, you know, energy efficiency, the, the homes that people live in, especially, you know, a lot of our marginalized you know, populations, a lot of our renters in Ithaca, I was a renter in Ithaca for a long time it's not always the best place to be a renter um, for a lot of reasons. And part of it is the things, you know, and the, the, the condition of some of these houses. So to me, I think, you know, using a billion dollars to, to really target, you know, our, our infrastructure, our, our buildings and our homes to improve those, you know, and trying to build green workforce along with it. You know, one of the things that we're seeing right now and kind of the, this federal level and in Congress and part of the reconciliation talks and the infrastructure talks is this idea of a civilian, you know, climate change core, you know, and I come from, you know, I'm an AmeriCorps alumnus, you know, I was an AmeriCorps VISTA in Vermont, I worked with, you know, the National Civilian Community Corporation, you know, the NCCC, or probably got the whatever it stands for wrong, but, you know, I worked with those teams, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm a complete, you know, believer. I've, I've completely bought into to that kind of thing. And so I'd love to see money thrown towards that to see what could be done to, to really develop it. And we always had dreams, you know, when I was extension of what if we could do something like that locally, what would that look like? So that maybe that's where I would spend a billion dollars to try and develop something like that. I, it is a very good question. Uh, you know, I have told a lot of people, I think, you know, I have a, 
I, I read, well, I used to read when I had time, but, uh, you know, there, there is uh, an author that I absolutely love. Her name is Mariana Mascaru, and, and she is just, uh, you know, fantastic at, at, you know, trying to bring all the economic with the human issues and, and all together and try to think of uh, different solutions. And then she, she uses very often the, the example of uh, the moonshot, the original moonshot, you know, when Kennedy, at that, uh, you know, Rice University uh, speech where he's like, we're going to get there. I don't know how, man, but we're going to get there. And, and then the amount of money that went into that. And it, it's incredible. You know, it's historic approach. Like, uh, you know, if you bring that to, to you know, uh, current equivalent amounts of money, it's just an enormous amount. It's trillions of dollars. But uh, a very small part came, came from the government. You know, the ones that were actually, you know, trying to finance the mission. And what happened is that, new processes were created, you know, new ways of financing were created and considered. So everything changed so much. So I also believe that, uh, you know, if you get a billion dollars, what I would do with that is turn that billion into 50 billion. You know, I would try to find a way of multiplying that money. And, and, and you know, once again, going back to the entrepreneurial approach, you know, you don't want funding from venture capital. You want smart money from venture capital. Yes. And that smart money should help you to, to, to do things with it. And I really think that uh, what we can do is, is precisely that, is, is try to use that money to, to you know, to, to generate opportunity, opportunities for funding, but also opportunities for change. And I don't know if I would put a billion dollars towards the, the electrification program, uh, but definitely, you know, some of it will go to, to the actual capital, you know, expenditures associated with some of the programs. But I think for the most part, I, I would try to find a smart way of, of uh, you know, making that money, you know, eventually evolve and, and become much more uh, in terms of benefits than what a billion dollars can buy you. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. There is a, a long question here. I think there's a few of them. Oh yeah. You know, so you know, I, I think you know, I, I saw a couple of them. I guess I, you know, maybe let's start with this one. I'll, I'll tee you up for one, and then I'll read the next one and maybe take it myself. But you know, I think this goes kind of part and parcel with what you were just talking about. But you know, Reggie's question about you know, there's a lot of people in this area that love the area, committed to addressing climate change. You know, how do we make best use of those resources? Well. Uh... To nobody's surprise, I think that, uh, you know, the people working in these, and I'm talking about Luis, Rebecca in the city or Terry, I mean, we don't know everything, uh, uh, I mean, at all, like not even close. And, and the people supporting us in our jobs in the county and in the city, you know, they're doing their best, but they're not experts. And, and this is a first, you know, we're trying to do something for the very first time. And, you know, I always take lessons from, you know, these, these different ecosystems that, that, that have evolved as, you know, as, as centers for innovation or, or, or actual social change. And when you look at them, it is all about the intellectual diversity that comes into making it work. It's not about the money. It's about, you know, how you actually take advantage of that diversity. So I think we've been doing that. We've been talking to people. I, I, I have met so many people. I get advice every day. I, I get told how to do my job every day by somebody else. And But I really welcome all of those. Uh, and and there, is, there are opportunities to get involved in, in, in so many things. And it's all about reaching out. And, and I believe right now the, the Itaca Green New Deal can count at least 50 volunteers that are devoting uh, a third or half of their time to being part of this. Uh, I've been meeting with a number of groups and, and Every group has a different perspective. So I, I think it is a committed community. Uh, and, and what you need to do is to reach out. I, I mean, if, if you are out there, you want to be part of this, you know, I'm sure that both Terry and I would be very happy to, to talk to you and, 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 and work on something, bounce ideas off each other, and then figure out whether what we have is, is, is the right thing to do. Yeah, no, I think, I think that makes sense. Um, Kind of try and fly through a few more of these because I know we're we're running close to time. You know, Aaron's question, you know, is basically talking about you know heat pumps and electric vehicles, the cost of them, and, and the need for local incentives. Uh, you know, I think it's not just local incentives. I think if anything, you know, even if we had local incentives and we got everyone in Ithaca and Tompkins County to do it, we'd still be in a world of trouble. I think we need, in general, you know, these federal incentives, you know, we need state incentives, any incentives that we can get to try and reduce some of these prices. I think, you know, this idea is multiple dealers, is that going to help reduce the price? 
You know, I think to a certain extent, I think that the I hope is and having multiple dealers, though, is what you see right now is a situation where, you know, you have a lot of people that want to have heat pumps installed or that want to get work done to their house. And we just don't have the workforce for it anymore. And at the same time, we have a lot of people that need jobs that need good paying jobs. And so it's really trying to connect, I think, those two those two problems into one solution of, you know, how do we get this green workforce developed so that, you know, they're able to, to supply the work that, you know, they're able to help bring down some of those soft costs that we were talking about before. And that hopefully we do see some, you know, added incentives from the state, from the federal level, and, you know, maybe even locally, if, if we're able to, to see some of the, the plans that Luis has come to fruition. But, you know, it, it's all together. I mean, even if I think, you know, we were to offer heat pumps for free tomorrow, you know, you wouldn't be able to get one for a while just because we just don't have the workforce to install them at this point. And I think that's that's something that we don't want to lose sight of is that we really need to make sure that we're getting prepared for, for what this next stage could be. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. And I mean, none of what we're doing is easy. And uh, there is a question from Brian. Uh, and I think it's a valid question. You know, like a lot of people on this call, fortunately, they have been fighting this for a really long time before you and I came to the picture. Uh, and some of them before you and I were born. And, and it's kind of nice to see that, uh, but well, probably before you were born, not before I was born, but you know. Uh, but Brian is, is talking about, you know, when we actually want to fight for something that we believe is right and it goes co counter to what, what the government is trying to do, you know, they disregard our opinions as, as you know, you're getting in the way of progress or, or you don't live here or, but election time comes and you know they want our opinion they want to know like uh, you know that we agree with them and and it's it's just interesting at that moment um i really think that uh you know trying to answer uh you know brian's question is uh, well implicit question in, in the comment he makes is is we we need to come together as a community and we need to demand from the people who are leading these communities to do right by us and I, I know it's ironic, we work for government and, you know, we would be telling people, you should demand more for me, but, but that is true, you know. We took this job knowing that, that we serve way beyond the county or uh, the building or the city, or city hall, you know. We, we serve everybody, but, but it is the same for every legislator, for the mayor, for the county administrator, for everybody, you know. So I, I really think that these opinions need to be heard, and I think they need to be socialized and they need to be supported. And I think it's all about establishing conversations. And I know that you have tried that, Brian, and you have, you probably are tired of that, but uh, you know, it, it, it's a new group of people who are more aware, who are more, you know, waking up to this. And a lot of us are trying, we just need to synchronize, work together, coordinate our efforts. And, and that's the only way it's gonna happen. And I hope it's not too naive uh, as of an answer for you. Yeah, <laughs> knowing Brian, it, it, it... I don't know how he'll take that answer, but I think it is important to remember, you know, that there have been successes as well with some of these approaches. You know, I think, you know, what Brian and a, and a lot of the other folks on this call, on the Zoom were able to do with the Maplewood Apartments. You know, my position, your position, you know, a lot of this comes from, you know, years and years, if not generations of kind of advocacy and pushing for these types of things. And so, you know, it's it's slow going. And I think for a lot of us, that's one of the most frustrating pieces of all of this, because we see the urgency, we feel the urgency, and yet we also just see how slow things are going. And it's, you know, it's maddening at times, but, you know, I think at the same time, we have to, you know, definitely celebrate the successes, but continue to push where we can. And so, you know, continuing to be engaged and, you know, for Peter's question on the north side apartments, you know, I think that there's a lot of, you know, issues, um, you know, some of them structural, some of them not. And I think, you know, continuing to put on public pressure, I think, you know, continuing to have conversations. I know Brian Needed was, you know, meeting with some folks, I think, last week on this topic. I know some people in my office are working on it as well. You know, it's one of those things where I wish that Luis or I could, you know, you know, wave our hands and suddenly everyone would be forced to put in, um, you know, heat pumps and electrify everything. You know, unfortunately, we don't have that power, but I'll say that, you know, I think from both of our sides, we're going to continue to push where we can, you know, internally and, and really try and help educate, you know, our legislators, our common council members, you know, on the importance of this. I think, you know, just as much as, as our role is to, to work in the community, to work on internal, you know, efforts, I think part of it's also just trying to be those experts that Luis called us at the beginning and trying to, to help, you know, both of our, you know, respective elected bodies understand really the urgency, you know, behind all of this and really what's going to need to be done in order to kind of push this forward. 
And you know, I, I, I want to point this out because I, uh, I came really to this job six months ago and, and I had absolutely no idea about, you know, like how this works or who's who and who's working with whom. And, and you know, I, I was talking first with a lot of activists and, and very few people in City Hall because, you know, it was COVID and nobody was around and it was really hard to, you know, to know even who to contact. And then uh, I, I get this idea uh, from from activists, you know, what needs to be done. Then I had the perspective of, of City Hall and the mayor and Common Council. And honestly, I believe that, you know, legislators, the mayor, the city, uh, the, the council administrator, everybody, you know, we're talking about good people, like really. And I really don't want people to think because of, of something we say or the way we say that, that we believe they're not. They're good people. They, uh, I honestly cannot think of a single one that, that has anything different from the best uh, of the community in mind. And I really think that uh, we just have different ways of approaching the same issues and we have different priorities. And, and in, in our case, we believe climate change has to be number one priority and we need to convey that. And we need to you know, show them that it has to be the number one priority for them. But at the same time, we need to understand that some people you know, need to take care of other areas of the economy you know, and, and there is reimagining public safety right now, which is which is incredibly important at the same time as the Green New Deal. So I, I think it's it's just hard, you know. Uh, but but we're working towards you know making progress. I think so. Uh, I I honestly think that you know we're gonna get there. Um, I I think there is this specific uh, question about the north side apartments that 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 keeps on coming back in the chat, uh, and and I think at the end of the day, what what we really need to do is, is it need to find a way of, of communicating these uh you know to the people involved in these projects to the people regulating these to the people that could have influence in these projects and, and we can work together with, with that goal in mind and and try really hard you know to make them understand some of these projects came before uh you know the energy code was you know passed uh, so legally, it, it's difficult, you know, it becomes a, a moral choice in some cases, not only, uh, you know, once the legal avenues have, uh, you know, are no longer available. But I believe that, you know, there is a lot that, that can be done still. I don't know, the, what, what do you think about that, just to probably close, Terry? No, I mean, I think, you know, I think there are things that are being done behind the scenes. I don't think it's always, you know, evident from the outside. I think there are a lot of people pushing and, you know, we'll just continue to hope that you know the right decision is made ultimately. I think you know at the end of the day, this is the importance of you know things like the the code supplement of things like you know fossil fuel bans and, and things of the like. So I think that's you know we don't want another situation like this two or three years down the road. So it, it's imperative to act now to avoid that. So um, we'll do what we can on the current issue and and try and change it so that it doesn't come up again. That's kind of the the best that we can hope for right now. It's a very political answer. Wow. Yeah, that, that that's Sorry incredible. That. Like, <laughs> no, that's not but what I was going for. I really don't think it was a political answer. I think it was just the one answer that there is right now. I think I agree with you a hundred percent, and 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 we'll do our best, you know, and and that's all. And I believe that all I can tell people is, you know, I'm gonna try my hardest to make it work and to make it work for everybody, not just for a few. It's difficult. It doesn't mean it's impossible. And and once I said. You know, we're trying to do something and we have the odds against us. And somebody told me that, you know, don't be defeatist. And it's not that. We're just aware of where we are standing exactly and precisely where we stand. Because that just means we know, you know, we know what we have to do now. So uh, that that's my take. And, yeah. uh, so, Rebecca, I don't know. How are we doing with time? Yes, we out. are. Yeah, true to form. We are out of time and over time. Um, but I think that that is a really good note to end on that both Luis and Terry are definitely not here because it's easy, but because they love it and it needs to be done. Um, so thank you so much both to Luis and to Terry for being here and for chatting. Always interesting. And for everyone that tuned in today, thanks so much. Um, the recording will be available on the 1000 Conversations YouTube channel um, if you wanted to send it to friends or family. Um, but thanks again for voting for our title. So subscribe to our newsletter to see what we ended up with. Um, you can find us at 1000conversations.org. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you.